my dear friends, welcome to the Christmas Box Angel program. My name's Richard Davis, and my, me and my wife Tamara have been asked to uh, conduct this, this program today. This is such a beautiful monument that we have for, our, for Spanish Fork. Uh, I want to tell the story about it a little bit. I do it every year, and I do it because of the people are the uh, first time they've ever been here. Uh, many years ago, a man by the name of Richard Paul Evans wrote a book called The Christmas Box. And in it, uh, there was a mother that had lost a little girl. And she would go to the cemetery every year. She, the, the child died on December 6th. And she'd go there every year and go to a, an angel that was there and mourn her child. And uh, people would start to call Mr. Evans and ask, where is this monument at? And there was not one. There had been an angel in the cemetery a long time ago and had been destroyed. But so he decided to go to the Salt Lake mayor and to the Salt Lake Sexton and have an angel built in the Salt Lake Cemetery. And on December 6th, the anniversary of the death of the little girl in the book, it was dedicated in Salt Lake. Many years later, 1999, here in Spanish Fork, uh, Mickey and uh, Larry Johnson lost a little grandson. And they thought it would be really nice that if we had one of these in our community, a Christmas box angel. And so with a lot of donations and contributions and a lot of hard work by them, uh, in July of 1999, this statue was dedicated. And on December 6th at 7 o'clock on 1999, they had the first Christmas box angel. Isn't that wonderful? And it's dedicated to all of us that have lost little ones. A place where we can come and feel the spirit of our little ones. It's been such a great holiday tradition for me and my family. It starts off the Christmas tradition for us to come here and to celebrate and to honor our little ones that have passed away. It's just one of the good Christmas traditions that we have. We'd like to start our program tonight by having Spanish Fork City Councilman Chad Argal give us a prayer. Following his prayer, I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Raymond. She's from Spanish Fork, and she has a musical number that she's going to sing, and I'll let her introduce that um, musical number. Our dear Father in heaven, we gathered here today to give thanks for our many blessings. Thou bestows upon us. At this time, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, we gather together here in this hallowed spot, and we ask that Thou would keep this place sacred. To those who come here would find peace and comfort. and know that there are many among us in this city that have faced the hardship of losing a little one. That they will find solace here, that they may feel the spirit of those who have passed on. And know that in the future, and the time will come, will they will be joined together again as families and that sorrows will be no more. Please bless those that take care of this place, that they may continue to keep it clean and well taken care of, and we're grateful for those who do that. Father, we ask a blessing on each one of those members of our community who have lost a child that thou would comfort, especially during this season. We are so grateful for the knowledge that we know that they are in thy hands. We ask to have a blessing on those who participate in this program this evening. And we again, again give thanks for the many blessings we have. And we ask and say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
I'm going to be singing on a still and starry night. Falling snow lights a glow, carols on the air. Shining stars, open arms, laughter everywhere. Of all the pleasures Christmas may bring, here are the treasures that make my heart Jamie, that was beautiful. Oh, my heavens. That was truly from heaven. Thank you very much. You know, we've been doing this for 19 years. 19 years. And we've had some wonderful music selections and some wonderful, and some wonderful speakers. Tonight we have another wonderful speaker. Brooke Nicole 
Goss. She uh, is a registered nurse. She was in the uh, newborn ICU unit over at Utah Valley Hospital. Um, she decided to retire and to become a full-time mother. Uh, she has six wonderful children. Two of them are in heaven. She's married to a wonderful man, uh, Jason. And that's how I got to know their story, is through Jason. Um, he does, he's in a, works with the, in the church with me. And I was talking to him one day and he told me their story. And I just asked him if he would come and speak tonight. And he said, my wife is the best speaker. And so I would like to introduce to you, Brooke Nicole Goss. Thank you so much. I feel grateful and humbled for the chance to stand with you tonight and, and share a piece of my heart as we all remember our precious children. I feel inadequate to, our, to articulate my feelings about my own journey. During the holiday season, I am more keenly aware of the absence of my two boys as we hold family gatherings without them. This candlelight vigil has been a source of healing and comfort for me as I look around and realize that I am not alone. I hope tonight is helpful for you as well. I know that everyone standing here tonight has their own story. It is precious to you, and if it is anything like mine, it is a composite of the most sacred and peaceful moments, as well as the darkest and most painful moments. Before 2014, I had only been to two funerals that I remember, and they were for great-grandparents. Death was for old people. It was foreign. Our journey starts on, in July of 2014. We went in for a routine ultrasound with our fourth child. They told us it was a boy, and then proceeded to tell us a laundry list of concerns they had about our little one. About two weeks later, he was diagnosed with trisomy 18, a condition that is incompatible with life. They told us if we chose to carry him, it was likely he would die before he was born. We decided to name him Eli, which means a son to God. His middle name, Aaron, means messenger. Despite his inability to speak to us, we learned so many things from him. During my pregnancy, we decided to make the most of our time with Eli. With the help of our kids, we created a bucket list of things to do with Eli. Most of it was very ordinary. We did things like go to the pumpkin patch and go camping. Those are memories we treasure. Miraculously, I carried him full term and delivered him on November 5th. When he was born, the doctors told us his life would be measured in minutes, not hours or days. My husband and some other family members were able to give him a blessing. Several minutes after the blessing was over, he began breathing on his own and lived for five hours. It was a miracle. Most of our family was able to meet him briefly, and our three children, who were nine, seven, and three at the time, spent this time reading and singing to him, holding him, and having a family dinner with him. It felt as if time stopped for those five hours we spent with him. We felt, com we felt complete and at peace. It might not make sense to some, but I felt I had an entire lifetime with him. We coined the phrase Livy Leet. His name is spelled E-L-I, and so if you add a T-E on the end, it's, it says elite. Um, for us, living elite means living the way Eli lived, fighting for what really matters and never giving up, living in the moment. Living in elite le means we live deliberately and purposefully, we do things on purpose and with purpose. After his death, I struggled a lot. My grief swallowed me up for a time. I just couldn't imagine living the rest of my life without my son. It was too much to bear. I had faith in my Heavenly Father's plan and believed I would see him again, but nothing could have prepared me for the pain I felt at being separated from my son. Ten months later, me and my husband were very surprised when we felt the pull to have another little one. I was not in an emotional place to do that. I did want to have more children, but didn't feel ready for this step. Despite our anxiety about this, we moved forward. I remember praying, probably not very reverently, telling God that I wanted it noted in heaven because I know they're keeping track of everything, 
that I thought it was a crazy idea, but I was still willing to do it. We found out we were pregnant very quickly after that. We only told a couple of people. Our parents didn't even know. We hadn't told our children. I was still so overcome with grief and so sick from the pregnancy. I was just trying to survive. We went to our 20 week ultrasound. It was a terrifying experience after our experience with Eli, but we were told we were having a healthy baby boy. I should have been overjoyed and relieved, but I wasn't for some reason. Two weeks later at a routine appointment, I found out that our baby boy, Miles, no longer had a heartbeat. We had to call our family and friends and tell them I was pregnant, but our baby died again, and we would let them know when the funeral was. Telling my living children about Miles was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Miles was born on January 26, 15 months after his brother. Miles' death rocked me in a different way. I was already at such a low point. I had felt very directed to take this step, only to have him die. It felt painful and cruel. This was a very dark time for me. Despite this, I felt a sense of completion that I hadn't felt from the many months that followed Eli's death. As frustrated and confused and, angry, and as angry as I was, there was also a sense of peace. I felt I had completed part of my work that I had promised to do before this life. I knew that these two brothers were together and that was the way it was always meant to be. We never intended to add to our live elite phrase, but after miles we added the verbiage miles above. To us, living miles above means we can't simply live a little better if we want to if we want to be with God again and by extension Eli and Miles we have to live miles above much better in the last LDS general conference Donald L Hallstrom talks about miracles he says what about the innumerable faith-filled priesthood blessing receiving unendingly prayed for covenant keeping full of hope people whose miracle never comes at least in the way they understand a miracle at least in the way that others appear to receive miracles my limited knowledge cannot explain why sometimes there is divine intervention and other times there is not, but perhaps we, we lack an understanding of what constitutes a miracle. Often we describe a miracle as being healed without a full explanation by medical science or as avoiding catastrophic danger by heeding a clear prompting. However, defining a miracle as a beneficial event brought about through divine power that mortals do not understand gives an expanded perspective into matters more eternal in nature. Both of my boys died, but there have been many miracles along the way. I'll share just a couple. Eli was born alive, that was a miracle. He continued to live for five hours, that was a miracle. After his death, I thought I would never feel joy again. I do feel joy again, that is a miracle. I have a very real and continued relationship with each of my boys. That is a miracle. I still love and trust God. That is a miracle. I have learned that the most beautiful miracles are not always the most obvious ones. I want to say a couple things about time and space. The ground we stand on in this cemetery is a sacred space. And the time we spend here, like tonight in this bitter cold, is a sacred time. The word sacred means entitled to reverence or respect. It also means connected to God. There is also space in our hearts. The space where we keep our children is most sacred, and so is the time that we spend there. I want to read a poem by Corey Ten Boom. Um, it's called The Tapestry of Our Lives. She's a woman that experienced enormous suffering and loss and injustice, and I appreciate her perspective and her faith. She says, my life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors, he worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows he loves, he cares, nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. In the Book of Mormon, the prophet Nephi echoes the same idea. He says, I, do, I know that he loveth his children, nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. 
I do not understand why I've had to experience these things in my life, but I know that God understands and that there is purpose in it. And I want to close with one final thought about suffering from one of my favorite people, Jeffrey R. Holland. He says, if you're the Savior's disciple, you better be ready to walk a while where he walked and suffer some of what he suffered. The road to salvation goes through Gethsemane and goes a little way up Calvary, and you only have a small cross. Now when these hard days come, do not say, God must not love me if he lets me suffer. The thought that he does, he does not love you when you suffer becomes blasphemous when you think of all the Savior suffered. God does love us, and he wants to heal us. Healing comes in its own way for everyone. I readily acknowledge that healing will never be full for me or any of you until our children are in our arms once again. But the rawness of my wounds are being greatly soothed by the passage of time. I know that God lives, and because of his Son, we will see our children once again. I also believe that God can provide us the strength and comfort until that much anticipated day comes. I know that when we lose a child, God understands what he's asking of us because he also lost his beloved son. I feel my boy's absence every single day, but I also feel their presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. That was so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brooke, for that talk. Um, I want you to look at this Christmas tree that we brought up from last year, uh, the decorations on it and the ornaments. Remember, I, I asked if you wanted to put a, a monument or an ornament on there to uh, remember your little one? the come and bring it and put it on there and, and many of you did uh, it still stands today anybody that w would like to put an ornament on that tree please come and do it uh, we'll keep this tree here until the first of the year and can continue the tradition we had that terrible s storm Sunday and it blew that tree over and sort of ruined it a little bit so we've had to fluff it up a little bit and fix it up but it's still here there's some beautiful uh, ornaments on it reminding us of our little ones uh, continue to come and decorate it for us. We will now have the lighting of the candles and a moment of silence to remember our little ones. Uh, my young women's in our, my, my ward will come around and start lighting candles for you, and then if you'll just share each other, and then we'll have that moment of silence.
I, I've got some people I'd like to thank at this time. I'd like to thank Carrie Hanks with uh, Carrie's uh, Design and Floral for furnishing the carnations. I'd like to thank the Spanish Fork Sextons for coming and taking care of this monument every year and taking care of this beautiful cemetery on how they do it. They're just wonderful. Uh, Spanish Fork City for furnishing the sound system. Um, I'd like to thank the Spanish Fork 7th Ward Young Women's for uh, handing out the carnations and the candles. They help me every year. They're just wonderful troopers and come out every year to support and, and support me in Tamara and, and the community. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Chad Argyle for saying the, the, that beautiful opening prayer that we had, for Jamie for that beautiful music selection. Thank you so very much. Brooke, what a wonderful talk. Thank you so very much for what you've done. Uh, I'd like to thank each and every one of you that come here to share your spirit with us, to help us with our gr grieving and, and our trials and our tribulations, that we can share each other's and to feel each other's spirit. Thank you for being here. I appreciate all that you do. I'd like to now bring Jamie back up and have her lead us in Silent Night. Following Silent Night, uh, we will have anyone that has lost a little one this year, if they will come and bring their carnation and put it on the, the monument. And then following them, the rest of us, we can put our flowers on the monument after that. Jamie, and then we'll go from there. Jamie. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child.
that concludes our program for tonight. I want you to know that on this beautiful angel on her right wing is the word hope. There is hope in this world. May God bless each and every one of us with hope and love and comfort through this beautiful Christmas season. Thank you for coming.